we'll start off today's lecture and the course with a video. Ever wonder how Spotify knows exactly which songs to recommend next or how your email filters out spam so efficiently? The answer lies in a fascinating concept known as machine learning. Machine learning, a subset of artificial intelligence, allows computers to learn from data and improve their performance without being explicitly programmed. It's like teaching a child to identify different shapes. You show them several examples and over time they start recognizing the shapes on their own. That's the essence of machine learning, teaching computers to identify patterns and make decisions. One of the most common types of machine learning is supervised learning. Imagine a teacher guiding a student. That's exactly how it works. The model is trained on a labeled data set, essentially learning from past examples. This method is popular in applications like credit card fraud detection, where past transactions can indicate whether a new one might be fraudulent. On the other hand, unsupervised learning is like learning to ride a bike without training wheels. The model is given an unlabeled data set and must discover the underlying patterns on its own. This method is commonly used in market segmentation where customer data is analyzed to identify distinct groups. There's also reinforcement learning, a method that resembles training a pet. The model learns to perform certain actions based on rewards and punishment. It's often used in gaming and navigation applications where the model must learn the best strategy to win a game or find the fastest route. Now, you might wonder, how does a machine actually learn? So this was a two and a half minute video, <clears throat> which I prepared specifically for this first lecture. Now I have rudimentary Photoshop and movie making skills. How many hours do you think this took me? One hour, two hour, five hour, 20 hours. Any guesses? So since this is a machine learning lecture, this actually took me five minutes. I gave a prompt to a website which under, which under the hood uses machine learning and creates such videos. Did you notice anything specific, anything particular you liked about the video? Did you notice how synchronized the text and the visuals being showed were? For example, when they were mentioning things like supervision, they actually had a student and a teacher. When they were talking something like reinforcement learning, they actually had a dog, a pet, and a human being, right? So this is just showing the different capabilities that we can get via machine learning. Now, you might be thinking this is only possible for very big companies with a lot of money. But in today's lecture, I want to show you, give you a glimpse of how you can write 50 lines of Python code and you can do many of these things on your own. Right? So firstly, let's look at a demo, <clears throat> which is somewhat comparable to what we did in the creating a video. But rather than creating a video, I'll generate an image. You don't need to really care about the code. Right? So there's a bunch of 30, 40 lines of code, which I've written. But as a result, I am giving certain prompts, like a small happy dog and owner learning to walk on a rainy day, and colored photography. And this took me about a minute to generate these four images. Okay. Few years back, this required very expensive hardware setup and a lot of expertise. Or you would have to have a lot of Adobe Photoshop or similar kind of skills. But in today's day and age, these things are quite possible for computer scientists like me, which is both good and bad. We'll discuss about the bad towards the latter part of the lecture. And given that a lot of us have grown up watching Batman, I just tried creating something Batman cinematic lighting, dark background, high resolution. So again, within a matter of seconds, we were able to generate something like this. I wanted to take it a bit further. I wanted to create a research. I wanted to create a logo for my research group. And I told that it's called Sustainability Lab, which works on AI for sustainability and applications in health, air quality, etc. The generations are quite poor. Although the first one, for some reason, resembles a little bit of IIT Gandhinagar logo. Small kid with a big smile, they had pretty good answers. Right? I was also trying to do something similar only for 
specific subset Indian audiences, and I could see a lot of bias there. And then I wanted to create some image for, what do you think, the last prompt I, I had in mind? What do you think I had in mind? Do you, know, do you know an academic campus which is on the edges of a river? Our campus, right? So let me know if the images look somewhere resembling what our campus might look like, if a very good photographer took the images. Is there some similarity? Right? Of course, not a lot given that our river is slightly below the land area. But the main thing I wanted to show you was that it's not now just the big companies which can run this. So all of this code, which I'm showing you, I ran it locally on my, not on my laptop, but on a server with a GPU. Right? This is to show you the capabilities that we can now leverage. So typically, I've been showing this slide in the first machine learning course, <clears throat> in, the in the machine learning course in the first presentation, talking about the amount of machine learning you have on your devices now like Apple Siri, Google Now, or whatever is the equivalent now, and Windows got now the equivalent now. Now, you can do a bunch of things. You can ask them questions. My favorite question for today's lecture is going to be, who is the Prime Minister of India? And if I ask that to Siri, or Google, or Google Now, or Google Assistant, Windows Cortana, it should take them a matter of milliseconds to generate the answer. But think about the amount of things which are happening under the hood. First, you take a speech, you take some speech, convert it to text. Then on that text, you do a query on some database, get some results. You have to filter those results. You have to send those results to a text to speech engine, which speaks the answer to you. Right? That's what Siri would do. If I would ask, well, who is the Prime Minister of India? Siri would speak to me. Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister of India. Right? Do you think we can do something like this in today's day and age? What might it require us to do? Do we have the capability to convert speech to text? Do we have the capability to search a database? I will be showing it in a different way. Rather than searching a database, I'll be using a large language model, something like ChatGPT to do this, which compresses the entire information in a pretty small model. And then I'll be showing you how we can also generate speech. Right. Again, all of this I have run locally on my system. So this is the audio which I recorded. Who is the Prime Minister of India? And then I'm using an open source library called Whisper. This is from OpenAI, the same company which is powering ChatGPT. And I am trying to get a transcription of this audio, which is in English language. And it gives me the text who is the Prime Minister of India with certain segments and certain other things. I can also use a text-to-speech engine to, let's say, speak out the same question in a different person's voice. Who is the Prime Minister of India? So this has taken me about four or five lines of Python code. This is a text-to-speech engine. Again, all of these, the two things which I've shown are being powered by certain machine learning algorithms. But I wanted to actually answer this question. As I mentioned, you could either search a huge database like Google and get the answer, or what many of us are doing these days is to use something like ChatGPT. But again, ChatGPT is a hosted service. I wanted to use the equivalent, which is a local service. I'm using some local large language models. I'm using something, the specific one called Llama2. I'm answering, I'm giving this question that please be concise. And I'm, ans I'm asking this LLM to give me the answer. Right? And as expected, it gives the answer to the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. I can now give this answer to my speech engine, and it should be able to speak. The this. Prime Minister of India is Narendra Modi. Right, so within a yes. matter of seconds, now we can do entirely what Siri was doing on your local laptop, on your machine. Right? The modern day laptops have powerful GPUs where you can run many of these things. Now I wanted to take this a bit further. I wanted to see how some technologies like these could be used to help you people, right? So I had a YouTube recording of my course from a previous run, the same machine learning course. 
and I will take that YouTube video, I will download it, I will extract the audio from it. Let me play the first few seconds of the audio. So the, uh, the sentence is important. I want you to hear it again. Please sign up on Google, uh, so Google Classroom with using the given code. And then I was mentioning that if you are not attentive, you're missing the announcements, you will have no one else to blame, right? Blame. Now, I use the same OpenAI Whisper to transcribe this entire lecture. So, so the reason I was transcribing this lecture was that YouTube didn't provide closed captions automatically for this video. Usually, subtitles, if you see subtitles, people don't write the subtitles on YouTube video. So that takes a lot, lot of time. It's a tedious process. YouTube automatically does this under the hood. It gives you the subtitles. For this particular video, YouTube didn't. And I wanted to create that. So I again ran it through my Whisper model. And if you notice, it seems quite accurate. Please look at the code mentioned above. Please sign up on Google Cloud. You will likely end up missing the announcements and you'll have no one else to play with. So machine learning can go wrong also. I said you will have no one to blame, and it says no one else to play with. Right? So it probably missed a bit of context. It just was looking at words for words. And probably the Indian English, it's not as well tuned to as compared to the American or the British English. But once I have this text, I can also create a subtitles file. So those of you who know the subtitle files is with an extension .srt. So this is again a very simple Python function. I am able to create something like this. I can speak it as I was showing earlier. Please look at the code mentioned above and see. Yeah, so again, for some reason, it picks up only very s certain kinds of accents for Indian people with a lot of biases. I then wanted to do something else. I said that, I thought that, Perhaps there is a larger audience who doesn't understand English, but they understand Hindi. Can I use machine learning to convert this English to Hindi? Again, if you've used Google Translate, you have used a hosted web service for this. But I again wanted to use something local, five, 10 lines of code, and it gets converted into. Now, anyone who's preparing for any exam which is in Hindi, this is a very good exercise. Look at the level of Hindi word that's produces. Kripya upriyukt code ko dekhe aur kripya Google Cloud par sign up kare. Hum pehle se hi kuch ghoshnaye karne shuru kar chuke hain. And this one is the funny one. Aap shayad ant mein ghoshnao ko kho denge. You'll miss out on certain announcements. Aur aapke saath khinle ke liye koi anne nahi hoga. Like no one, you'll have no one to blame. So firstly picked up, you'll have no one to play. And then when it converts to Hindi, aapke saath khinle ke liye koi nahi hoga. Dusra tuarit logistic. So I had to look up what tuarit means. The second, I said the second quick announcement, where it means to hurry up, something like that. So it's a good exercise. But apart from the fun aspect, which we are having right now, I think it can open up the doors for people who may not be very conversant with English, but who understand the technology well, who can still pick up using a different language. Now you can convert it to any of the languages. I hope that in one of the future lectures, I'll be able to show that there are so many such advancements happening in India and we can probably show some, showcase some of them. Now, to become useful to all of you, I am also prompting this with some nice prompts. I think you should also, like, if you use ChatGPT-like services, well, you may benefit from it. For example, I'm asking it to provide a bullet point summary for the given text. The entire lecture, one and a half hour lecture, it will just condense it to some bullet points. Highlight the important topics. Give me some questions based on the following text. I won't lie, I have used this prompt once to help create some questions in one of the quiz, in one of the course, so you might as well give it a try. Summarize the following text in Hindi in 10 lines or less. And it is, I saw that it broadly got very nice summary, machine learning, definition concepts, recognizing digits using machine learning. So this is the second lecture, not the first lecture. It all talks about the performance measures which I showed give some questions on the, so give some quiz-like questions. And in Hindi also it did quite well. It just gets this particular name well, but that's just because the transcription wasn't very good. 
right? So a lot of these capabilities we didn't really have last year, or they were not that openly available. But now we can do a lot of things with machine learning if we put it to good use. If you have any questions, you can prompt me at any point. <clears throat> so this is another one of my favorite video. So this is showing a grocery store where you have to buy very few items, let's say only one or two items, and the people in front of you, let's say this is DMART, just to contextualize it. And there's a long queue, you have to buy only one or two items. The people in front of you have to buy their entire home. Right? It's unnecessarily waiting. If you've studied something like operating systems or any amount of any course on scheduling, you might say this is a very bad strategy. You may want to have the shortest job first. Right? So this is very hard if you have to wait. There are certain mechanisms which people do so that people don't have to wait this much. Any clues, any ideas on that? What can you do if you have to buy only a few items and the store wants to have high throughput? It need not be a machine learning solution. Separate queue for? We can have a separate queue for people having lesser items. So in a lot of the stores in the West, you have, you have queues labeled five or less or 10 or less. If you have five items or less or 10 items or less, you can go through them. They also have self-checkout stores, uh, queues. So you have the barcode, you just scan them and you go away. Right. Let's see what Amazon had as a solution which is much more sophisticated. This is slightly older technology now than the next slide I'm going to show. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Okay, how do you think this worked? I specifically stopped before 30 seconds just to be on the safer side with YouTube so that they don't flag me in case I upload this lecture. Any thoughts on how this might have worked? How might you go to a store, pick up something, it automatically gets built to your account, and then you walk away? It captures the images of you, or? It has to capture the images of the item. So, so what you are saying is that it is perhaps a computer vision based technology where you have cameras everywhere, and the cameras continuously monitor what has been picked up. What is the status of the different uh, different compartments. How, how will it get to know if you've picked up something or not? Sorry? So weight of the shelves, you may have additional sensors. So not just computer vision, you may have some sensors which measure the weight. What else could you use? How will it know that you have picked up something and not someone else has picked up something? It has to have something like facial recognition or some kind of biometric, or it has to have some, some communication between you and the store via either Bluetooth or some other technology. Right? So it so it's basically showing that you have to have all of these technologies working seamlessly together in order to enable an overall product like this. Let's watch. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. <coughs> if you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. Okay, how might you break such a system? I want you to act as an adversary, as a thief. Let's say this technology were to come to DMART tomorrow, the closest one, what will you do? You are students, you are very short on money for some reason. And you have got placed and you need to give a party. Okay, good. So you will pick up, you will get so what he's saying is that you'll pick up some jar, let's say some, some chips or some biscuits, 
you will figure out its weight, you will empty that, you'll get another jar of the same volume or exactly same and maybe fill it with sand with the same weight and then put it back. Do you think that will work? So it may be one such way to fool the system. Or you may, so it has to be very, or you know, so it has to be very careful. So when I have seen, personally seen, that it's very rare that people pick up something and put it back at the same place. You can have people putting things back at different places. Again, such technology may break there. What could be some negative implications of such a technology in a country like India? In the West, perhaps they don't have uh, that population density. But in India, we have a lot of population, in India and similar countries. What could be some negative implication of such technologies? OK, so he's thinking like a technologist, and he's thinking about the flaws in the technology. Someone else may be charged with what you've bought. Right? Or you may be double charged, something like that. What else could be there? Broader implication. What he's saying is a technology implication. <coughs> Employment or unemployment. So there are perhaps millions of such people who are employed by such companies. What is the problem or what is the limitation of such people who are employed, which the technology doesn't really have, those kinds of problems? Technology doesn't really need leaves, right? It doesn't get sick, like typical pandemics don't really affect technology. So the companies may have certain incentives to not hire people but rather invest that amount of uh, money in such technologies. So then a lot of the people who are skilled in particular jobs may get out of jobs. Right? And this has to be very carefully thought of because we should not be completely giving up on technology. At the same time, we shouldn't be forcing technology prematurely, which will, en which will ensure that a lot of people are out of their jobs. Right? So careful balance might be needed. That's another thing I want you to pick up from today's lecture, we have to understand the consequences of both sides of the technology. Like the technology is definitely very cool, but we need to see the other side also. And as promised, we will again see that if we can do something like this on our own devices, I will again show a code which I had written in in about 30, 40 lines of Python. So I'll start off with an image like this. I will do something known as object detection using an algorithm known as, in this case, I don't know whether I'm using, uh, algorithm known as faster RC. So this is the input to my algorithm. And this is the output from my algorithm. It tells you about potted plants, chairs, bowls, vase, bottles, etc. So they may want to do something similar, but on the compartments, right? And the categories may not be just chair or bowl or potted plants. They may be Oreo biscuits, uh, Britannia biscuits, etc. right? They may want to do something like this. And they may also want to do something more sophisticated, which is slightly more expensive, but which is known as segmentation. What do you notice in the annotated image? So in the previous example, which I showed you, object detection, I had bounding boxes, squares, or rectangles. Now can you see that the cutouts are matching exactly the shape? Right? So I'm showing them in different colors. The chair is being colored in one particular color. The drawer is in some other color. So this particular task is known as segmentation. Right? Again, we'll see in the course, hopefully see some parts of this in the course, how we can do this. Again, I'm using an open source library from uh, Facebook called Segment Anything. You might have heard of the library, but I'm just showing again how you can run this locally. Any questions thus far? So after this, I want to show a demo which is in homemade. So we designed this system in a lab and we recently published this paper. This is on measuring the energy expenditure while we are running, while we're doing some exercises. People regularly use their phones and watches to keep track of their physical activity and fitness levels. Two of the popular measures that users often look at while exercising are heart rate and calories. 
The phones and watches have become quite good at measuring heart rate, but calories are widely inaccurate. For instance, in our study with over 50 participants, we found the calorie expenditure estimate of a modern smartwatch was wrong by almost 40%. One of the most accurate ways of getting caloric expenditure is using an indirect calorimeter, but they are expensive, very bulky to use, and almost impossible to carry around. Another measure that users find useful is respiration, but except a course estimate while at rest, respiration signal is almost entirely missing from consumer devices. We present Jowl Dye, a thermal imaging-based approach to measure respiration and caloric expenditure. We use a thermal camera to observe the condensation around the user's nostril when they inhale and subtle increase in temperature when they exhale. We also measure the changes in the temperature of different parts of the user's face while they exercise. We collected data from 54 participants while they either biked or ran and estimated their respiration and caloric expenditure. When compared to a clinical indirect calorimeter, our estimates were almost 5% wrong. In comparison, a consumer smartwatch was wrong by almost 40%. We also made a smartwatch prototype for Jalodite and used a lower resolution thermal <coughs> camera to engineer for cost, size, and battery. As evident here, the resolution is significantly lower, but the condensation due to inhalation is still visible. We demonstrate that Jalodite is immediately deployable and can measure respiration and caloric expenditure in real time in several settings. Overall, a simple addition of even a low-resolution camera to a phone or a watch can improve the estimates of two of the most important physical measures in our daily lives. So through this video, I wanted to show you the entire pipeline of how we may deploy machine learning in various applications. You'll pick up a certain problem. In this case, our problem was to measure your calorie consumption while, while you're exercising. You'll have to pick up certain baselines. In our case, we looked at variables such as Apple, Samsung watches, and we had to get a gold standard which measures your true signal of interest. In our case, that was something known as an indirect calorie meter. The indirect, cal the indirect calorie meter measures the respiration. It measures the amount of oxygen and CO2 in your breath, whereas the Apple watches and sorry, the other variables, they typically just look at your heart rate. Right? The, the amount of calorie consumption is definitely dependent on the amount of oxygen and CO2 in your breath, inhale and exhale. So we then designed the system to somehow measure your, your respiration rate. And then you have to convert the overall problem into something which is a computer science, or sorry, a machine learning like problem. In this case, the machine learning problem was, we saw that your nostril will show the condensation. Right? when you are breathing in and out using a thermal camera. Now you have to, your, the machine learning problem is can you detect your nostril, one. Second, can you track your nostril as you are exercising, because as you are exercising you will move very rapidly, vigorously. Third, once we can figure out your nostrils, the location of your nostril, can we convert that into a respiration signal. Fourth, once we have a respiration signal, can we convert it to calorie consumption. Right? So each of these can be thought of as small machine learning pipelines, which are then finally combined, and that's when you'll get an overall result. Right? So you'll see this pattern repeating many times across the different machine learning applications that we've been seeing thus far. You have to set up the problem statement, you have to boil it down to what the machine learning specific problem is. You have to figure out the inputs, the outputs, the baselines, the ground truth systems. You have to come up with certain intuition which is often coming in from the domain. In this case, the intuition from the domain was that respiration is important for calorie consumption. Second, respiration is very evident from your nose condensation, which then we said that let's leverage thermal imagery. Right? So therefore, I wanted to understand the entire pipeline and not just focus on once I've obtained this data, I've got a publicly available data set, then I can do something. But once you understand the entire pipeline, the process, I think it will make you better in machine learning. Let's look at yet another application. Billion people are estimated to live in poverty <coughs> around the world. That's a billion people living on less than $2 a day. Poverty reduction is one goal that almost everyone can agree on. Last year, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals set 169 separate development targets to be met by the year 2030. 
with poverty reduction as a principal goal. Does anyone know what these development targets are typically called? The development targets which the UN has given? There's a very specific term. Some of you who've done hackathons may know this. SDGs, have you heard? Sustainable Development Goals. But how do we actually track progress towards these goals? Right now, our ambitions exceed our capabilities. Most countries don't collect much data, and scaling up... Okay, let me ask this question before I show the solution. So they want to first... So the goal is to overall improve, reduce poverty across the entire world. But first, they need to get a measure of poverty levels. How do we get that? How do you think we may get the poverty levels? What does, what does the Indian government do to understand the income levels? Census. When is the census held? Once every 10 years. Oh, 20 is wrong. Once every 10 years. Sometimes there's a bit of discrepancy, especially if there are pandemics, etc. But usually 10 years. Do you think the country changes a lot in 10 years? So then you have a snapshot every 10 years, but the entire landscape might have changed. The rural to urban migration might have changed, the average income levels might have changed, etc. So it's a good solution, but it's not scalable. Right? That's one word you'll want to hear a lot in a machine learning course and want to do something about it. The existing system is good, but it's not scalable. So now, whenever you find things which are not scalable, you want to get some proxy signal. Right? Something which is proxy for poverty. What was proxy for, for respiration in the previous example I showed? You, the condensation on your nose, right? That was a proxy. And we could measure the proxy easily and then use that to somehow convert into the target quantity of interest. Now, target quantity of interest is poverty. What do you think could be proxy to measure pro poverty, which can scale well? Number of people having homes. When people have homes or when people are above a certain income level, what do those homes contain? Electrical appliances. If there are electrical appliances in homes, what signal can you get out of them? One is the energy signal you can get. The second from, can you close the door? Can you close the door? The other signal that you can get from, let's say you want to make it even more scalable. Can you get something from a satellite? light intensity. So you'd probably see the metro cities in India like Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Calcutta, Hyderabad, all of them have a lot more light in intensity in the night compared to some rural places. Now, obviously rural not necessarily means poor and having more light does not necessarily mean uh, more income, but on average you'd see that this holds true. So this is what this particular group is trying to show. Can you get a sense of the light data and from that you can measure and map the poverty levels? Building people are at data and scaling up traditional household survey based data collection efforts will be expensive. What if less conventional data sources could help shed light on these development outcomes? That's what our project does. We combine high resolution satellite imagery with powerful machine learning algorithms to predict how rich or poor specific locations around the world are. But standard machine learning approaches to interpreting imagery work best when they have lots of data. Think millions of labeled images. Unfortunately, there are few places in the world where we can tell the computer with certainty whether the people living there are rich or poor. Our solution is to combine high resolution daytime imagery with images of the earth at night. Places that are brighter at night are usually more developed. We use this nightlight data to help us find features in the higher resolution daytime imagery that are correlated with economic development. Without being told what to look for, our machine learning algorithm learns to pick out many things that are easily recognizable. So just a quick question. Does anyone know from what date is the satellite data typically available? Is it 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s? So this may come as a shock. It's actually from 1970s. Right? So you might recollect the moon landing, etc., was late 60s. And since 70s, certain satellite products are available. 
So now if you want to understand the change in the planet, you can actually look at the data from 1970s to 2024 now, and you can track very nicely. Let's look at the next application. So this is an older talk from Sundar Pichai on something known as Google Duplex. To make you a happy appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So this um, get, got a lot of applause because this is a very common American way of pausing. Ours is slightly different. Any, what, what do we typically use when we make pauses? Mm, uh, something like that, right? Uh, there's an, mm -hmm. so, very, so if you go to the West, you'll hear this very commonly. And we, we just saw the transcription speech to text, text to speech. Now this whole demo might have sounded very sophisticated back in the day, but today's lecture in the beginning I showed you a Jupyter Notebook, which allows you to do something similar. Right? They can make an appointment, they can talk on the user's behalf, they can summarize. They may have to do certain other things which they'll show in case there are some, let's say if the salon is not available, they'll have to understand your client's calendar in order to make such things better. Now, again, a very cool technology. Why might, why might you not like such a technology? Or what could be some negative consequences? No negative consequences? Reduced communication. OK. So he's saying that perhaps if you always have a machine to do tasks, which you are currently doing, you will stop doing those things. You may become lazy or you may lose the ability to even strike a conversation. <laughs> Phishing attacks, uh, increased spam attacks, that is actually happening. I had a relative getting a call in, like their family members got the call in their relative's voice, asking for some money. So it's happening these days. So you have to be a little careful about that. Many of us are also com very regularly pestered with these calls from different telecom companies asking to switch to their plan or take their insurance or sign up for, in today's day and age, sign up for their online course material, things like that. So sometimes I actually get emails, two emails in a day, one asking to be an instructor in such online education courses, some, one asking to be a student in some online education courses. So imagine that now currently they have human beings who they pay to make these calls, who get frustrated when people don't respond. But again, they can just put a machine now, which will tirelessly keep calling people. It can loop over all the numbers it has. Right? So we have to be a little careful with such technologies also. Let's see if we can do something using machine learning to save our planet uh, by reducing the energy consumption. Hello. Who are you? I'm Bidley, your personal energy advisor. The utility company sent me. How did you get in here? You downloaded my app. All right. Well, let's see how your energy consumption compares with the neighbors. Yikes. What do you mean inefficient? We just bought this new refrigerator. Take it easy. We'll figure this out. Let's see. Looks like your base load is pretty high. So they're giving you certain kinds of feedbacks on how your different appliances may have used energy, et cetera. So there have been a certain amount of surveys which ask questions on what might help you reduce your energy consumption. Right? Some of the options were, if I were to tell you that 
if you were to reduce an energy consumption by some x amount that will lead to x number of trees not being cut. Second, if you reduce the consumption by x kilowatt hours, x units a month, that will amount to lesser carbon emissions, right. These two worked moderately. What do you think worked the best? What kind of feedback, what kind of message to the users led to the most improvement in their energy consumption? You can raise your hand and say. Reduce electricity bill, that was another option. If you save your, if you reduce an energy consumption by X units, you will save X rupees a month. That also worked well, but there was something which worked even better. Going by the video of competition with neighbors. Yeah. So all you need to say is that your neighbor had X units of consumption. Now you don't need to tell them anything, they will figure out on their own now. Right? What they need to do to just do slightly better than the neighbors. Although I've had this conversation with certain people and they say that this may or may not apply to different geographies. In certain geographies, you want to show people that you have a better car than your neighbor, right? So this may or may not necessarily work, but in the specific geography in which they did the test, this thing worked. Now, their goal is to figure out how much each appliance is consuming. Now you can do that by putting a sensor on each appliance. Does that scale well? No because we have 40 appliances in a home, 40 electronic appliances in a home. So again, in machine learning, again and again, we come back to this question, how can we scale something? So we could not do the census survey because that didn't scale well. We could not put an indirect calorie meter because that was very inconvenient to measure your respiration. We cannot <coughs> put a sensor on each appliance, that does not scale well, it's very cost uh, prohibitive. Let's see if machine learning can come to our help. Pretty high. You've probably got some big offenders that are pulling power 24 7. Here's a couple of examples. I thought that you were getting rid of that Xbox. I, uh, yeah, I'm with her. You get rid of this man cave machine, you could reduce your base load by 10%. Really? Yeah, and that's just the beginning. Oh, wow. Well, looks like you guys had a pretty wild weekend, huh? <laughs> yeah. Wait, here? Yeah. No, no, we were out of town. Oh, looks like your AC didn't get the memo. Did you forget to turn it off before you left? That sounds about right. Well, that made a pretty big thing. It's all good. In the future, I'll send you texts whenever I see a spike like that. Oh, I'll even know you one better. With this guy, you can control your thermostat from anywhere. So apart from doing all the chores, apart from uh, telling how much energy different appliances using, apart from helping you to save energy, it can probably also cause fights in the home. So to be a little aware of the technologies. Self-driving cars, again, they have been around, in and around. In certain parts of the US, you already have these cars driving around. This video still scares me when I see no one in the driver's seat. So this technology may sound, may look very sophisticated. This is built on something known as reinforcement learning, which we saw towards the beginning of the lecture for a couple of seconds. Here's a video on reinforcement learning. This is a very typical, so when you study this concept of reinforcement learning, you end up studying this problem known as cart pole in gym. Some of you have studied that might have heard this. You are, so you have this, this horizontal, uh, cart over which you have to move this thing while balancing. If the angular velocity goes below beyond a certain threshold, it will fall. Your aim is to keep it balanced so that you can move around.
And you see the goal was to balance this as you're moving. Now, this is not a very trivial task. And building on foundations of this is how you can build up your self-driving cars, where you have to take certain decisions, which are sequential decisions. Should I move my car left or right? Or should I press an accelerator? Should I press the brake? Should I change the gears? Similarly, you had to make certain decisions here. Do I move left, right, with what velocity? So the basics are the same. Now, for those of you who are who have studied something like control systems, if you are in probably in electrical or mechanical, you might have studied such subjects. You might have solved. Seen, has anyone seen a problem like this? Has anyone studied control systems, like courses? So you might have seen such problems being solved with classic control. Anyone here heard heard things like P PID PIE control? So that's the classic way of solving such problems, and reinforcement learning is the machine learning way of solving such problems. But imagine if you have a self-driving car, and the car in front of you looks like this. Now, a few, a few slides back, I showed the notebook where we were, we were putting bounding boxes, trying to identify things. So the so self-driving car is also trying to do that. But it probably sees a car, a car, a person, a bike, Etc. And now it's thoroughly confused at this point of time. So this may just cause a crash, right? So self-driving cars are very cool, but we have to be a little aware of the underlying technologies that they are using and what are potential pitfalls of those technologies. Let's take another look at an application which requires us to understand some the motivation behind using ML for healthcare. Okay, so they have a premise that you want to monitor the health of people, especially they want to monitor the health of elderly who are living alone, but they want to use your home to monitor the health. How do you think of your home can monitor your health? By health, I'm talking about things like, let's say your heart rate, your pulse, your, if you're walking, if you're doing any activities or not. What can you have in your home which can monitor such things? Again, think of scale. Think of the first baseline that you may have. Instrument the person with 100 senses, right? Have them wear a phone, have them wear a wearable watch, some wristband, something to measure their lung function, etc. You can have hundreds of such sensors, which is very inconvenient, doesn't scale well. Again, so you'll have to come up with certain things which are proxies for these quantities of interest. And that's what they're doing in this. Chronic disease patients, we can avoid many of these hospitalizations. Now the question is, how do you monitor health at home? Unfortunately, the picture today is not very lovely. If you want to monitor breathing, you need nasal swab or chest scan, heartbeat, pulse oximeter, motion for body sensations. You have to ask them to wear all the sensors on their body, uh, hold uh, something on their neck, and see. You have to ask them to put all of these electrodes on their head and see for it. What if somebody comes and tells you that we can monitor all of those things in the home without asking the patient to wear any sensor on their body? That's exactly what I do in my group. We invented smart Wi-Fi box that uses the what? So they're using your Wi-Fi router to measure your health. How? How can Wi-Fi tell about your health?
echolocation. Who said that? Okay. How do you? Okay. Probably they're trying to capture it and do something. Okay, so if you have a phone in your pocket, you can perhaps be localized using the Wi-Fi access point. So if I, in fact, uh, if I am standing right now, I am getting the signals from all of these access points. Each of them, I am getting a different signal strength. In fact, if I just have three of them, I can triangulate myself. That's how some of you might have seen movies or the equivalent in the 90s in India was CID. They, you'll need three access points or three cell towers to localize yourself. So you could localize yourself, that's one thing you could do, but you'd require multiple access points. What else could you do? We're talking about things like respiration rate, heart rate, etc. How can your access point of Wi-Fi router tell you that? You started off in the right direction. So it's sending out waves. Right? If waves uh, strike certain walls, what do they do? They bounce, right? If I have an open room, the wave will propagate further. If I have a very closed room, it will bounce back. It will have multi-path, multiple reflections. So they are leveraging all of this. your breathing, your heartbeat, your gait, fall, even sleep, and all of that without putting any sensor on the body. Now, you might be surprised, but actually, you can actually see here, you are in a sea of wireless signals, Wi-Fi, cellular, everything. And every move that you do, you lift your arm like this, it changes the electromagnetic field. And those changes, actually, we analyze them with AI algorithms in our box. And we know you lifted your arm, you took breath, or this is your heartbeat, and without any sensors on your body. Let me show you a video of this. This is a home, and the wireless signal spread in the home. And actually, they reflect off our bodies and come back to our smart life. So you're looking at the reflections, you're measuring them, and then based on that, you're deciding what activity you were doing. Auto reply used to be a big thing, and so this was introduced around 2016. I attended the live talk in which the technology behind this was presented. Now it's been there for a long time now. So we are very used to having automatically choose three options, right? Now, one of the motivations behind giving such a technology is that on the go, when you're using the phone, it's very hard to type a lot of text. But if you're given certain three options, you will probably be able to reply quicker. So it's adding more convenience. But what could be some downsides? of an auto-reply-like system. How many of you use Copilot? What happens to you when the internet is down? What happens? Do you feel a tremor in your hand? Do you feel that you are somehow you don't have the capabilities that you once had and you're confused what to do, right? So if you are always using the options readily available to you, you may not be exercising enough your muscles or the capability to choose them on your own. Second, would you be just biased to give in one of these answers? Right? Because of the convenience that you're getting. Perhaps if the options didn't exist, you would go on your desktop and you would write a big long answer which gives in all the explanations. But maybe you are just wired to choose the path of least resistance. Quickly choose one of the options. That may lead to some back and forth or some miscommunication. So in fact, uh, recently there was some survey done in the US in which they were asking the pilots, uh, they did some test of pilots where they disabled the autopilot. And not all of the pilots were able to land. So we also have to be always uh, careful when we are in flights that the autopilot system is working. But we also have to be a little considerate of the fact that how are we using such technology. So purposefully, I sometimes turn off co-pilot and see if I still have the capability to write the code. And I 
Fortunately, I still have. <clears throat> Does anyone know this person, Lee Sodol? So he's the world champion in this game called Go. It's an ancient Chinese game. So he was uh, world number one. But at that point of time, so I talked about the reinforcement learning and some of the things which were going on. So Google came up with their own version of Go, which is known as AlphaGo, the game engine. So for chess, they have had engines. We've had engines since 90s, mid 90s, which are fairly good. But for Go, which is a much more sophisticated game, this was mid 2010s, 2016, 17, something around that time. And Lee Sudol lost badly. Now, you might be surprised or shocked to know that Lee Sudol has retired from the game. He felt that the human competence level is nowhere to be matched now. It can't, be, it can't match the machine's level. And he has just retired from the game. Imagine if the same happens to your favorite game. Like we just had Inter IIT. Right? So would events like Inter IIT even happen? Sports even happen? If such thing were to happen in all the sports. So just think about the consequences. But it's also been used a lot, especially in the time of COVID. Every research group across the world, like not literally, but a lot of research groups in, across the world were trying to detect COVID or pneumonia, et cetera, given the chest X-ray images. Right? But there was something very surprising which came across in a lot of such studies. So if you can see my mouse pointer, a lot of the studies pointed out that this is the region which is most important for detecting the severity of COVID. What do you think is so special about this region? Which tells about COVID? Doesn't have to be, it's not a very difficult question. What, what do you have here, which is likely to tell? I mean, the entire thing is lung. Diaphragm. So how do you think diaphragm is indicative of COVID? So this is, if you try and think of this question from machine learning or from medical perspective, you will never get the right answer. So this is the place, like it could be this place also, which I'm just telling, just, just indicating. So this is the place where the name of the lab was written. So whenever you get x-ray done, you have the laboratory trademark or signature. Now it turned out that for this specific study, a lot of the people who, so who use this data set, now whenever there was a severe case, they went to a bigger lab. Whenever there was a lesser severe case, they went to a smaller lab. So basically the lab name decided whether the person had COVID or not. Again, you have to be careful about how you're using machine learning and how explainable it is, how interpretable it is. But it was being used a lot. How many of you write LaTeX? Have ever written LaTeX? Has there been a time where you realized that there were some symbols you don't know? Like mathematically you know, but in LaTeX you don't know. How will you solve that problem? Search online, but how do you search? You'll probably search that some symbol which looks like differentiation symbol, differentiation in LaTeX, something like that. How do you think, what do you think about technology like this? It's called DTechify. You draw a certain symbol using your mouse, using your pointer device, and it gives you a few options. Right? Now, this is not very different from what you'll do in your second assignment, which will involve classifying digits as well as classifying certain of these specific symbols that we're drawing. This is to show you that you can draw and deploy, you can use machine learning and deploy useful applications for yourself as well. Now in the age of chatbots, this slide has slightly become redundant. I used to show this earlier. Like visual question and answers is very commonplace these days. You can give an image, you can give a prompt, and you can ask certain questions. This used to be a very non-trivial thing a few years back. The boom in AI slash machine learning can also be seen in various conferences. So nowadays conferences have huge halls. We have had some students visit them in the past with up to 10,000, 20,000 attendees, right? These used to be 1,500 attendees. So this is just showing you the amount of interest 
in these conferences, in the field in general. But there are certain, certain instances of machine learning gone wrong. We have already discussed some of them, some more. So Uber had an accident, Tesla had an accident, their auto driver machine, their autopilot machines had an accident. One of the reasons they had accidents, some of them have had an accident, is the limited knowledge which the people possess who are driving these vehicles or who are behind the wheels on these vehicles. In certain cases, these are auto, not autopilot, not completely autonomous, they're assistive devices. So they always recommend, many of them recommend that you're behind the wheels, you don't completely leave the wheels, or the steering wheel. In certain cases, the technology is different. There have been instances of bias in machine learning. This has been fixed since a long time. There are certain languages like Turkish, which are gender neutral, which means they have the same pronouns for male, female. So for example, he, he is a babysitter, gets translated in Turkish to Obir, Bebek, Baki, Shishi, and she's a doctor, gets translated to Obir, doctor. But this is where the bias exists. If you bring it, bring these things back from Turkish and want to translate them to English, they translated babysitter to a she and a doctor to a he. This is exhibiting the bias which exists in the data set. But fortunately now, such things have been addressed. Such things, so this is how typically research works. There'll be a group of researchers who will flag such issues and then there'll be another group who will correct, work on correcting those. At this point, uh, so yeah, there are some other kinds of machine learning solution which end up being racist. So some of us may have a giggle about it, but so anyone who's having a giggle about it, you should just go to an international airport where you will very likely be flagged. Anyone who's been to an international check-in lines, uh, very often uh, people who are not of certain races and colors, they can, they can also get flagged. So you have to be a little, uh, you have to be careful about the fact that machine learning can, gen can also be racist. This is an easy question for us, but if you were to ask majority of the people across the world, they will probably think only the left one is the right, next one, the right one is not the right. But that's also exhibiting a certain bias which exists in the data sets. But the good thing is none of us are biased, right? Do we agree? Let's do an exercise. I need all of you to take out a piece of paper and a pen. Okay, your exercise is to draw a shoe. Those who don't have a piece of pen and paper, you can draw it in your head. Just draw a shoe. Okay, last 10 seconds, difficult question. Okay, I think all of you should just stop and don't change your answer now after watching the video. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? Okay, how many drew something like this? This. How many thought this? How about this? Okay, how many do this? One, two, three, limited, right? But we just said that we are not biased, right? So this is showing that certain kinds of biases exist within us. And you'll see like based on just the proportion that we'll have, 
we'll have a lot more of the first two categories of shoes being drawn compared to the second, through the third one. You may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the other. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution, and just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. <coughs> Interaction bias, like this recent game, where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias, for example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a... Who's the last one? How many Nobel Prizes has she won? or the only one to win in two different categories, right? So what this is showing is if only shown certain physicists, then uh, certain kinds of images you may not even recognize. Right? Human bias, <coughs> even towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, We've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation. So the end of this video is very nice, very useful, I think. There's no magic bullet. The second, we all need to be part of the conversation. So we can also have, when you're talking about dangers of AI, we can have Barack Obama speaking. I'm thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. Foremost in all of our lives has been the loss and the grief felt by the people who are like most of us don't get our health care in the marketplace. We get into our jobs, working Medicare or Medicare. And what you should know is that, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups. And you can't get charged more just for being a woman. The injured employees come together to pass a cognitive bill that would boost America's very, very hard time. Some progress, at least in sort of the small town size of the legal community, I think it's real important. Oh, here we go. So we have elections coming up next year. Imagine if such things are done, where top political leaders are saying things which are unwelcoming. You have to be careful about the technology. Now, so earlier days, I think this required a very, a very well-trained engineer, very well-trained artist to do something like this. But now you just require someone with a very powerful set of GPU system and some skills to do this. We'll quickly just look at the definition of machine learning, and then we'll go on to some of the logistics of the course. We'll repeat this definition part and how to use this in the next class. So this specific definition has been coined since 1959. It's a field which gives the computers the ability to learn without explicit programming. So when we talk about something like explicit programming, I'm talking about things like DSA one-like courses, you have data structures, algorithms courses you have done. Right? write a program to generate the next number in a certain sequence, right? Those things are explicit programming, whereas in machine learning, we'll generally see a different kind of paradigm. The other definition, which is slightly more technical, is that you're learning with some experience E on some class of tasks T and a performance measure P, where the performance measure P will improve upon the experience that you've given. As an example, we wanted to use an image of an X-ray and predict whether the person has pneumonia or not, we will have the task of prediction, 
given an image, I want to predict pneumonia or not. So it's a classification task. We will have the performance measure as the accuracy that we have. The experience we'll have is thousands of images we'll give, which are an image, and whether or not they have the disease. So I'll now go on to some of the logistics for the course. You might have already seen the course website. It's my first name, my last name, github.io slash ml 2024. It's also there in the timetable, so you can refer to that. The first thing all of you should definitely do, and you should do this right after this class, because all of the further announcements we will be doing will be on Slack. So join this Slack channel. The other things you may want to know is that today was a special lecture here. The next lectures would be in block 10, 103. That was the originally planned classroom, but today it was not ready. So therefore we had it today. I will just modify this again. So the next lecture slash tutorial is in 10, 103. The next class is supposedly a tutorial, but because we've not had enough theory, the next class will also be a, a lecture. You may want to definitely look at the grading policy. So we'll have quizzes, assignments, attendance. Attendance is 8% worth, and the rules are clearly mentioned here. The assignments are in groups of five. There will be four or five assignments, total 44%. The last question in the assignment, last one or two questions in the assignment will be a project-like component. So while there is no explicit project component in the course, the assignments will be project-like questions. So your first assignment, would involve you to use some, we will give some data to you, where you have to tell, using smartphone accelerometer data, you have to tell whether the person was walking, sitting, sleeping, jumping, etc. And to make it more project-like, you'll have to collect some of your own data. So some of you are, let's say, taking your phone, you're running. We will we'll give all the instructions where you'll collect, how to collect that data. Then you will put that data across the own machine, your own machine learning model that you've used. Right? So each of the assignment will have some project-like component. There are four quizzes. The best three out of four would be graded, and they'll be 16% each. One of them is the mid-sem, one of them is the end-sem, and two in between. There might be a few FAQs, a uh, few questions that you may have. Like, is there a project component? I've already given a description. The course prerequisites, ITG and courses no longer have any formal prerequisites. But if you have to do well, you'll have to be good in programming, data structures, probability statistics, linear zebra calculus. I have given a prerequisite exam. Now, it's up to you to how honestly you want to do. It's an open book, open internet. You can use whatever you want. Uh, you can use the material which I've shared here for, the, for that exam. That exam is due to be submitted on sixth evening. This is the test. The link of the form is there. There are a few questions. It's OK if you don't know all the answers. You can search the internet. You can read up the resources. I have already mentioned a few resources in the prerequisites. Like These are a few things if you read through them. You'll be able to answer all of the questions. Some of these things we'll do in a lot more detail in the tutorials also. Right? So therefore, I want you to give it a serious attempt. If It's OK if you're not able to answer all the questions. But if you, it's up to you how you want to go about this. Laptop policy, no one is allowed to open a laptop in the class. The, if you miss a quiz, it will be marked as zero. That's the reason we have best three out of four. If there are very serious concerns, you can let me know. We'll figure out some way. The quizzes in semester will all be closed book, no notes allowed. We typically give back the answer sheets in four to five days. The quizzes will have a mix of MCQ and subjective questions. We will not have extensions for assignments, but we'll typically have, given that we have a big enough group, five people, it should be manageable. If you have doubts in the assignments, on the Slack channel we have a, on the Slack group we have a channel where you can ask such doubts. If you want to stick to some other programming language, unfortunately we won't entertain that. You have to program in Python only. The assignments will have a Viva component also. So where your group will be called for a few minutes, you'll have to explain your answers. And some of, even if you've written the answers, everything works, but if you cannot explain it satisfactorily, you will lose out on marks. The assignment is group. All the team members will get the full marks. 
oh, not the full marks, sorry, the same marks. The attendance policy has been mentioned in the grading policy. Are there any questions? There was a small subset of students who had some issues with the timing, etc. Doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, so some people have a clash. So I think all of you should therefore immediately sign up on Slack. If there is any announcement, all the further announcement will be made on Slack firstly. Secondly, if we need to change the timing to suit most of the students, we may have to discuss on Slack. Otherwise, we'll have to drop a certain number of students. Any other questions? If not, we'll meet on Friday. Yes. Number of? The number of quizzes is four. You want more or less? More? I can't hear you, can you? Okay, so one of the question is that can the number of quizzes be made more like last time? So you're already hearing the answer. So uh, I think we chose an optimum number based on past experiences. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll meet on the next, for the next lecture on Friday, as per the schedule. I'll try and upload some of these videos periodically on YouTube.